A little introduction. Uh, as my hat indicates, I'm from Virginia Tech. I've been there 38 years. I retired nine and a half years ago, and uh, no one knows it, especially my wife doesn't know it. But uh, I'm having a lot of fun because I don't answer to anybody except myself and, and the people who give me money to do research. So um, what happened is when I got to Virginia Tech, I was busy doing mine land reclamation, and eventually uh, I stopped doing that and got into what I call conservation agriculture. And how that got started is, is a story in, in itself. Uh, one day in the mail, I received uh, an envelope that had a photo in it. It was a picture of Interstate 58 in uh, Virginia, Hillsville, Virginia. And uh, that interstate had been blocked with soil coming off of a cabbage field. Now, that's a mountainous area in Virginia, and so they, they actually farmed about a thousand acres on really steep slopes. And it was so steep that they literally would plow up and down the hill. And uh, if you had a severe rain, like four or five inches in a, in a night, you ended up with a lot of the soil literally at the bottom of your field. In this case, it, it, it was so bad it went into an interstate and blocked the interstate. At the bottom of this photo, he had a four-letter word. Now, it's not the kind we normally hear around here. <laughs> it's H-E-L-P, help. So that started me into uh, an obvious need to, to produce cabbage on those steep slopes without plowing, right? You had to do it no-till. Well, there wasn't in in all the world that I, I, I searched, a no-till transplanter. And so for many years, I tried to help those farmers, and I also invented a no-till transplanter. And uh, when I say uh, invented, that's a 10-year period <laughs> where you try things and finally you get something that works. So after that, uh, my life was spent in trying to actually promote conservation agriculture, which is, I'll explain that a little bit later in here, but it, in, but it includes three things. One, conservation tillage, or reduced tillage, and also keeping your soil covered with something all the time, plus a, a good rotation. In other words, build up uh, a very uh, wide scope of, of species, species-rich systems instead of a monoculture like corn after corn after corn after corn after corn. And so I, I started doing that and was quite successful and I gave a lot of talks and, and a lot of publications in, uh, in magazines and stuff. And finally I realized that a lot of people that were interested in what I was doing were organic growers. And the reason they were interested is because I could get very good weed control. Because I used very heavy cover crops as a basis. As a basis of not only weed management, but fertility, especially nitrogen. And so with this conservation agriculture approach, I was able to grow really high quality organic vegetables. And then also I got involved in using farmscapes alongside of my plots to control insects, and that worked very well. So about, uh, I don't know how long ago, John, where's John? How long have we been doing this? Five, six years? Yeah. About, we'll pick a number, six years. Uh, I met John, and uh, he w was working with a product. He's called it different things, but we'll call it Chargrow now. And, um, he encouraged me to try this on tomatoes. And so what I did, I realized that a lot of the biochar, that it's, that's the big word in the, throughout the world, they were putting it on, acre, on a whole acre, like five tons to the acre and three tons to the acre, which to me was totally not economic, economical. 
And so what I convinced John to do was that we'd take a small amount and mix it with a potting mix and then, then grow these tomato transplants so that those, those roots then were saturated with this biochar. And, and uh, the char grow really is biochar that has been primed with, with uh, beneficial organisms. So what I would, John, do you want to? Okay. So in, uh, in 2005, we had done uh, trials with this char grow concentrate. And that was in a cornfield in uh, Ohio in the drought condition. And we did it about uh, 20 pounds of the acre down the row. So it's, it was placed right where the seed was. And we thought we saw a 28% uh, increase in yield at the end of the year. So then after that, it was like, well, hey, Ron, let's do it up there. Now, you had been doing compost tea. And I, and I was saying, well, maybe I, I can get around that. In other words, I think I have an inoculant that would take the place of compost tea. And I met you guys when you were eating pizza that time for lunch. Yeah. And Richard McDonald had got me there from Pat. So we, we did some stuff with corn. We did some stuff with peppers. We did some stuff with potatoes. And, uh, you know, you only have so much money to put into research. And Actually, it was very little money. That's the problem yeah, right yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> very little money to put into research. And so it was like, well, how those tomatoes? Well, the tomatoes look pretty good. And they, they had that about 28% at the end of the season. And he said, but boy, you should have seen the first pick. And so it was like, you know, you only have so many chips to gamble. So we put all our chips on tomatoes and let's take the data at the first pick. And that's when we saw the yield numbers that are, that are shown in this report. So that's how we got together. And Ron's right, you know, he's retired but he's a perfect guy to work with because he can do what he wants. Lots of times researchers at universities, in case you didn't know, are uh, needing to publish and they're needing to get their, uh, their tenure and all these types of things. So they'll do things to get there and they might say, well, we changed up a few things that you told us to do. Well, wait a second, I'm paying you. You have to do what I tell you. Well, no, no, we think this is better. And that's, that's where going to a professor emeritus he can do what he thinks is right based on the biology. And so the, uh, the product is, is a component of a whole plan. So you're using the biology to soil to, to do these things. And a big portion of the benefit we get is that he's the cover crop expert. So the cover crop gets tilled in at the time of transplant. It's using fish emulsion is the starter fertilizer, but a low salt fertilizer. And then because we have the primed char and some foods, the inoculant, then that, that plant is already rolling by the time it goes in and that biology moves out. And I have some theories about all the different levels of biology and what they're doing and how they get there, but that's what we start doing. And, and so I could tag along with one of his small projects and go, oh yeah, we'll put a little bit over in the corner and see if we see anything. And I don't really think you thought much was going to happen that first time. <laughs> but after the first season, he was paying attention. and. Now we're, we're getting the same kind of results every year. So let's take a look at that. The first page. So after this flyer, then you, we have this two page a synopsis paper that, uh, that describes what, what I did. And basically what I did, I put this at a two and a half and a 5% rate in the potting mix. And I found out that I really couldn't tell the difference. One year, maybe 5% was better, another two and a half. So, so at this time, I'm using three and a half percent and, and seeing good data. So if you turn to this next page, you'll see the it's a summary of three years. Now, I've been doing this now for six years, and I continue to get about the same results. So if you look at the left-hand side, it says control versus uh, CG inoculated, which CG is char his chargo, prime biochar. And so the first harvest, if you look at it, uh, was 18,900 pounds versus 28,400 pounds. Now that's a 50% increase in yield on that first harvest. That is incredible because what's, what, what part of the, of the tomato crop is the most valuable? The last harvest or the first harvest? Almost always the first harvest, right? Uh, and so that really turned me on. I, and he's right. The first year I thought, well, you know, 
I've done research for 35 years and sometimes it takes two or three years to convince me and a, and a scientific audience that, that what you're doing is right. It could have been an anomaly or some, something happened. And, but after three years, that was the average. This is the average. And, so, and then if you look at the next column, that's the total. And at the end of the year, I still had a 9% increase. So I get both earliness and, and, and total yield increases. Now, NS there at the bottom of 109% means not significant. So in statistics, it wasn't significant. But if it's repeated for 10 years and not significant, it is significant to the grower, right? I, maybe it's not to the scientist, but it is to the grower. So any questions on this type of research? What I did, the results. So at the time of transplant, they look like you see there. They're a little bit bigger, a little bit stockier. Then he sticks them in the ground, and it all evaporates. You can't tell them apart anymore, except where you marked it off. And then, but they, but they flower earlier, and they yield earlier, and they yield more. So the, that first time, we were doing some numbers one year. We figured it was probably worth about $6,000 an acre profit because you were early and more. So you can make a lot of money in the front end, you might skip one of the last pickings, you know? So only in the mix, not in out additional in the fill? Is that for this point? Right, so the inoculant uh, primes the plant. Primes the plant, yeah. During those six to eight weeks in the greenhouse. Then when it goes out, uh, a cover crop has been tilled in, so some of the biology's gonna feed on that because it's not just one set of biology. You can think of it as the whole soil food web. So you got decomposers, you got things that are gonna make nutrients more available to the plant. You got things that interact with the plant synergistically. You got all these things going on at once. So it's like uh, if, if you're played around with compost tea at all, you can, you can extract and you can grow so many critters. But at the time you spray it, you can put a little fish with it again and the biology jumps again in the field. And so that's what we're doing. His cover crop is feeding my critters, and uh, the fish emulsion fed them a little bit at the time of transplant. So the fish emulsion fed the plant and the critters. So there's a biological bloom happening at the time of transplant. Yeah, and then the uh, the char component, it, its most important aspect is it holds biology. So it's the condominiums. So you got all this biology held there longer, and uh, add them all up. And that's how you get it. So it's not it's not just I can't just oh biochar did it. No. It's it's that we did all those things and then didn't kill the biological tool, which is these practices. We practice what is called control traffic systems, which means my beds are in the same place every year. In fact, if my great great grandchildren come back, hopefully they'd still be right there. And I call it the grow zone area. And, and so no tractor would be on top of this. And we have been putting cover crop and cover crop, even compost periodically in there. So what's happening in that plot that hadn't been disturbed? The soil health is being built up. So it's not just one magical one ton of, of, uh, of cover crop that's going to make a difference. I think it's this long-term approach called conservation agriculture. So, so that's what I'm hoping to relay to you today. Uh, uh, what also happened is um, over time, after I invented this no-till transplanter, I got the bug. <laughs> I got the bug, and so I've, uh, I've, I've actually, when I say I, they're my ideas, but I have people at tech that take my ideas and, 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 and take them into the machine shop and, and build these different machines. So why don't we go out here and we'll take a look at these machines right now and um, uh, there's three different, three different machines. There's a compost applicator. There's a, there's a, there's a plastic laying machine that, 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 that just presses it down in the soil so it doesn't disturb the bed. Then I have a, one of these new rollers that's being promoted throughout the United States. And uh, I also have a no-till transplanter and all that stuff, but obviously it's not on that truck. Uh, so let's just walk out there and we'll spend probably around well as long as you can stand the sun and me talking out there.